few weeks ago, I got a lot of flack because I released a video going over a study, this study, that indicated that butter accelerated cancer growth in mice. And right about there is where many people tuned out of the original analysis, like Bobby here. And Jordan didn't even make it that far. However, while it is true that video was focused on mechanisms based on mostly animals, I always try to find evidence to corroborate or refute using human evidence, which is why I brought up this additional human study. So I'd like to flip the script and focus on this major study and address this from a different angle. So unless you feel like Kenny here or possibly more like Black here, let's take a closer look at the human evidence relating butter with cancer, discussing what we know and also what we don't know. And I think you'll be surprised. Real quick, if funding and conflicts of interest is vital to you, they're detailed in the description box. Okay, what we're talking about here is a 33-year study across three huge groups of people making up over 200,000 participants. Now, if you have any background in study methodology or simply watch enough science videos, you'll know that a study that lasts that long and has that many participants is an... Uh, it's an, so, uh, it's, a, it's an associative study. So here's another point where people will tune out and many might respond like the ever-wise shell derp. Of course, it can't go ignored that nutritional epidemiology can be weak forms of evidence, but I also fully believe that it can have significant upside and be a powerful scientific method. And keep in mind that we're looking at more than one piece of evidence. So would you feel more comfortable ignoring mounting evidence, even in its fledgling state, even if it might need further work down the road? Or would it be prudent to slowly make lifestyle changes out of caution? That choice is entirely up to you. At any rate, there are unique strengths to this study uncommon to many others of the same type. For one, the researchers measured nutrition every few years, which is not common in other studies of this type. They usually do single measurements at the beginning of the study. In addition, these particular included groups had their nutrition assessed, but also had their biological markers assessed to validate that what they said they consumed matched where possible. So this is as good as it gets, aside from a randomized control trial, which don't work for this kind of investigation. The main point that I want you to understand here is that this particular study has bolstered certain weaknesses common to associative studies. As I'll get into later, it's not all perfect, but it's a gargantuan effort. Now, because of the data is a bunch of numbers and many hiss like vampires hit by holy water when math is involved, I can't blame them, I'm the same way. I've created a simplified graph, but for intellectual honesty, here's the numerical data as well for those that know how to read it. Now, we're looking at three big groups and the relationship between increasing butter consumption and the death from cancer. That yellow line that goes up from the 1.0 indicates that there's no identified risk. So if the red lines touch the yellow line, there's no identified relationship between butter and cancer. Clearly, two of the three groups do not indicate a relationship. However, the third, as well as the combination of all the data, so all three groups pooled, indicates an estimated 12% increased risk of dying from cancer. And in fact, the same was true when looking at total mortality, so all causes of death. There was again an established link between total butter consumption and overall death. We can safely assume that at least part of that link is due to the cancer data that we just went over. So, is that it? Butter causes you to die from cancer? No. Not so fast, for multiple reasons, but let's start with this one. There's an excellent critique brought up by some commentary about this study by some other researchers. That critique states that the researchers combined butter with margarine blends under the label of total butter. Now, knowing that and knowing that these three groups making the total 200,000 plus group were first started to be studied back in the early 1990s, 
you might know that margarine at that time contained trans fats. So trans fats of the nature that we're discussing them are especially dangerous and destructive unbeknownst at the time, as they weren't phased out starting until like the mid 2000s. So a good 10 to 15 years after data collection started. Granted, I don't know how much of the total butter was contaminated with trans fats containing margarine. If it's 1%, then the link that we just went over likely stands. But if it's a more sizable amount, like 40%, would it really be fair to blame butter as the reason for this cancer link? The answer is most definitely no. So are we then doomed to have this potentially weak data as our only basis? No, not quite, because while the margarine mix-up was true for the total butter, it does not seem to be true for the two other ways that the researchers slice the data. Namely, when consuming butter added to food or bread, and when using butter in frying and baking. Here, interestingly, you'll notice that using butter during baking and frying did not associate with increased mortality risk, and yet adding butter to food and bread does raise risk. By the way, the exact same trend was seen for cancer-specific deaths as well. So this raises an important question. Simply, why? Well, we'll get into that next. And while I realize that uh, you may already be cross-eyed from what we've already been over, I actually have much more to say. And I do, including how other fat sources like canola, soybeans, safflower, and more relate to our mortality and cancer risk. Plus, does age, physical activity, and other factors change the interpretations and nuances? Now, I'm covering all that in the full analysis included for the Physionic Insiders, of course, along with an in-depth article. And if you want to discuss it with me in the next live session that I do with the Insiders, consider joining. You also get these perks over here too. Link to join the Insiders is in the description box. Anyway, back to the important question of why. Now, a few possibilities. One, and this applies to the previous total butter data that we just went over too, this could be due to something called residual confounding. Essentially, because we are looking at associations, we have to adjust or control for possible factors that would explain the results that we're detecting. For example, it could be that people who consume more butter also consume more alcohol. And that's the real reason that cancer and mortality risk is raised. Obviously, there are many factors accounted for, including alcohol, but crucially, diet quality, total calorie intake, family history of cancer, and physical activity level, among some other obvious ones. So could it be something that isn't on that list? Yeah, possibly. I will quick add that one thought might be that the increased risk might come from something like refined bread that the butter is added on. Fortunately, the researchers thought of that, and even when adjusting for that, along with uh, similar other factors, the relationship between butter and mortality remained. Still, that doesn't mean that something else couldn't be going on here. Otherwise, the researchers offer some other explanations, like the fact that the exposure to butter is less frequent when looking at baking or the amount of butter actually consumed when cooking is less than what's added to the pan. I think that at that point, we're getting into the weeds of the different possibilities. In the end, the main point here is that when we remove the margarine contamination issue, there is still some signal that butter is linked to cancer and overall mortality. Now, I will add, this actually isn't the only study that looked at butter and cancer either. In this analysis, looking at a completely different group of people by a different group of researchers from a different country, butter was also found to be linked to greater cancer mortality, interestingly, when replacing margarine even. However, I should point out that this study, unlike the main one that we've been covering, only measured nutrition at baseline, much like many of the other associative studies that you've probably heard of. This is a definite weakness of that study. Now, as a final word before we get into the hopefully nicely packaged takeaway section, there are also studies that indicate no increased risk of cancer mortality with butter consumption. That is not uncommon or unexpected. For one, these studies are smaller, so fewer participants means that there's less data to detect a relationship if there is one. In addition, meta-analyses of associative studies like these are 
and tend to have a whole array of different adjustments, like the list that we went over earlier. That vary from study to study included. There's more that I could say and more that I could get into, but suffice it to say that if we'd be critical of the studies that we went over, missing some context or factors that could explain the relationship, these studies are even more at risk of that issue. Like I said, there's plenty to be said, but as I'm often reminded, my videos are too long. Still, I wanted to acknowledge that it isn't true that all studies point to butter being a cancer mortality risk. Still, where does that leave us? Everything considered, that's what you probably want to know, I assume. Well, I have several things to say here. One, I said this last time, but 80% of people who were mad at me didn't finish the video, so I'll say it again, although I guess, honestly, the same thing is going to happen here. None of these studies speak to ketogenic diets. The reality is many might make that assumption, and I don't think it's a poor assumption, but we don't actually know if butter is still detrimental to those outcomes. So uh, cancer and overall mortality when a ketogenic state is an objectively different physiological state. Number two, it is true that none of this science is definitive. There is room for error and definitely room for nuance, the latter of which I will get into next. However, as more data releases, we're not just dependent on large-scale associative studies, which keep in mind they do control for many big factors. We also saw mechanistic direct causative data presented in my first video on the topic. So you have to ask yourself, do I believe that these growing lines of evidence from different perspectives are all wrong, or is there a possibility that there's a signal here that butter is harmful in the context of cancer? Oh, and I'll quick point out here, we're also talking about total cancer, so not looking at very specific types of cancer. Number three, the mechanistic studies that I covered last video was focused on an obesogenic environment, meaning overweight animals. Unfortunately, I don't think that we have overwhelming data to say if butter is a cancer problem in healthy, normal weight individuals. There's a signal here, but it was insufficiently teased out in these studies that we went over, and that signal contradicts the animal research. So the certainty is currently more in line with it being at least a bigger problem in an obesogenic environment. Number four, notice how we covered cancer mortality. None of these studies that we went over covered cancer occurrence. That means that we don't know if butter causes cancer based on these data. It's entirely possible that it is only a detriment when a person already has advancing cancer, which would be in line with the animal research that we went over. Number five, in plain English, <laughs> there's a small signal that butter is linked to increasing risk of cancer mortality and overall mortality. As is often the case, I'd like to see more data to really plug some of the holes, but that's where we currently stand. What you do with that information is your choice. The most risk averse would be to reduce butter consumption, taking into consideration the caveats from before. Now, Udo the Carnivore has this message for you about my work. That was in reference to my last video going over the mechanisms of butter and cancer. And to Udo's credit, I'm not entirely convinced that we have everything figured out on that front, as I'll explain. But if you'd like to see more on the direct evidence, just click here and join Udo the Carnivore in calling my work nonsense. Thanks for tuning in. I do appreciate it. I'll catch you in the next one. Till then.